Kelly from Winnipeg. And the title of her presentation today is Understanding Structural Racism, Case Studies in Education, Social Services, and the Legal System. And so, Nicole, if we could get you to turn on your video and share your screen. Hello. Absolutely. Thank you. Perfect. I'll make the pop up small so you all can see my screen. Perfect. Uh, well, Tansen Tutemtek. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to present this project uh, to you today. So it's not as theoretical uh, a presentation, but a bit more descriptive. Uh, this is uh, a project that I'm working on with a team. And it's an online course that we're developing uh, in the Faculty of Native Studies. And we created this course uh, in response to ongoing structural racism uh, and the inherent uh, accompanying violence in Canada and elsewhere. When we started this project back in 2018, uh, having conversations ab about this project, it was timely. And after the events uh, this, of this past summer, it, it's even more so. And, you know, this is not a, a for credit course, so it's not a semester long. What, we really saw a need for was a shorter uh, professional development piece that was geared not only for experts in you know uh, structural racism and indigenous issues, but really at non-experts, right, and, and and lay people with very little or or no knowledge or, or experience with indigenous issues to help recognize and, and tackle racism. And so how our course is designed is that it begins by breaking down key concepts into plain language, uh, using everyday situations uh, and examples. And then we apply this knowledge to three different case studies of K-12 education, child and family services, and the legal system. So nothing is done in a vacuum. Uh, I have an awesome research team. So while I'm the PI on this project, uh, I'm also working with uh, Paul Garot, who's an assistant professor uh, in the Faculty of Native Studies, with Jade Brown Tutusis, who's our uh, FNS alumni and community engagement coordinator, Sarah Howdell, who is the coordinator for the Indigenous Women and Youth Resilience Project, and Dr. Nancy Van Stuyvendale, who we've been seeing. So the innovations uh, of this project is that it's Indigenous led content uh, created to provide learners with meaningful Indigenous perspectives. So in other words, instead of talking about uh, Indigenous people, this is something created in large part by uh, Indigenous researchers. We grounded the work in the relevant TRC calls to action. And we point to successful efforts and suggest ways to tackle the problem. In other words, instead of just focusing on a deficit type of model and talking about the issues, and there are many and we unpack those, but we also encourage solutions and move toward uh, what's working, uh, especially at the community level. So to give you a sneak peek of, of what, this, uh, what this looks like, uh, on the landing page on eClass, this is available uh, available there or, or will be rather uh, you can see that there's a, a welcome page and the modules one two three and four which i'll explain further so when you open up the course communication there's a question forum there's a welcome to the course so this in theory could be taken by uh, folks outside of the university community so they may not be familiar with e-class uh, and moodle and how it works and then what happens when you open up module one, we have defining racism. And this starts with learning outcomes. You can see my cursor there, reading and viewing activities and checklists. So this is all video based and animate, uh, animation based as well, giving you a bigger sneak preview. How the landing page in module one works is that we equip the learner with the tools that they need to unpack racism because it's a big term and as a team we felt a lot of people really misunderstand and so it begins by differentiating between prejudice and discrimination as a thought versus action moving then into how racism 
becomes also racialization. In other words, an active process by which people are discriminated against. And then uh, people can click on the different levels of racism. And there certainly are more, but these are what we focused on, the individual level, uh, cultural based, and then structural racism. And what we also wanted to highlight is that racism not only happens in overt, as in obvious ways, but also in covert ways and you know, can manifest in ways through microaggressions, tokenism, whether it's in education or the workplace. And so how this works is that the learner can't just simply skip over this or take a look at this model. Um, again, this is just a sneak preview, so I won't go into all of it, but what will happen is that for each of these bars, the learner will click on say prejudice and a whole set of activities will come up. So there'll be uh, different animations, video clips. This is uh, constructed in a similar way to the MOOC. So people will have, a, the learners will have a PDF that they can download and follow the script, which is read um, out loud as well. So it's very interactive. Uh, so as they move through, then we move toward um, different lenses to reflect on the impacts of racism and racialization, namely unpacking the big concept of intersectionality and then equity versus equality. And we move into helpful approaches, you know, recognizing white privilege, uh, anti-racism with the intended outcomes of, you know, healthy and good right relationships and relations in terms of resilience, healthy allyship, and so on. So what happens after the learner has been equipped with all of that you know, base knowledge, we then apply it to three different case studies. And these are interactive and, and work in the same way. So module two uh, of the course is looking at education. And that's a super huge field, which could probably yield about 20 dissertations. So we narrowed the scope to K to 12 uh, education. And module three, originally we were going to look at uh, health and social services, but we narrowed it down just to social services, namely child and family services. And then uh, module four, which is policing and the legal system. And the reason that we presented the modules in this order is that we felt that it really pulled a thread through, uh, you know, through this the history of ongoing uh, colonialism and racialization. In that, you know, first we had education with you know the residential school system, which then. You know, we can see a lot of people then ending up in the foster care system, which then often end up in uh, policing and the legal system. So we wanted to show that these aren't new problems. You know, although all over the media you hear systematic racism and BIPOC, we really wanted to hammer home the point that these issues really aren't new. So when we look at module two, education, our main goals is are that we wanted to contrast pre-contact education with colonial education. In other words, folks were, you know, indigenous communities uh, were already teaching their children uh, through family, through kinship, through land-based knowledge long before uh, any settlers arrived in Canada. We also uh, provide examples of colonialism that continue uh, to weave their way throughout education system. So the learner is equipped with knowledge about, okay, well, where are we seeing structural racism and colonialism uh, in schools today? We also highlight Indigenous-led efforts uh, toward educational reform. And then we the module finishes by outlining positive ways for continued improvement and further learning across the education system. And again, we point to work that's been happening for many decades. Uh, for instance, uh, there was a paper from the Indian Brotherhood uh, back in the 70s, you know, that was, you know, asserting the thesis that, uh, you know, Indigenous children, you know, need to be educated by Indigenous, you know, Indigenous with Indigenous education and land-based learning and bringing that back. So again, we don't want to, you know, encourage a learner to reinvent the wheel, rather to say, well, Indigenous communities have long been advocating for solutions, and there are many positive examples right across Canada that are, are, that are working. We just need to listen better. So then moving on to the social services, 
we first discuss uh, the 60s scoop and what you know some newer scholars have been calling the millennium scoop. So all you know to talk about the high um, the high rates of ch children, Indigenous children, in the foster care system, and the problems uh, ensuing there. And then the main focus, uh, you know, drawing on the work of scholars like Cindy Blackstock, for example, is that we want to, you know really enforce the idea that Indigenous children need to be kept in Indigenous communities and that goals, you know, child and family service goals, social services goals, should be focused not on, you know, constructing this good family, bad fam family binary, but rather how to keep Indigenous kids in Indigenous communities. Because what we know is that you know, Indigenous kids have never been better cared for than when they are in their community and connected to their kin and their friends and their culture and languages. So again, looking at Indigenous-led efforts uh, in this regard, and then similar uh, and in alignment with the education module, we outline positive ways uh, for continued improvement uh, and learning about the child welfare system. So last but not least, policing and the legal system and the main goals in this module are to hammer home the point that Indigenous uh, laws and legal traditions are not a new concept. Uh, and this dovetails really nicely with the, the presentation we just saw. Uh, and so this module starts by examining the historical context of colonialism and racism in the legal system and then reviews uh, the impacts of current approaches and you know, prob uh, problems regarding policing, incarceration, I should rather say over-incarceration, uh, you know, misaligned concepts of justice and caring for victims of crime, and then outlines alternative approaches that focus on potential to reduce negative impacts. So the benefits of this research project, we certainly hope, uh, is that we use real world case studies. So especially for uh, a learner, even a highly educated learner, right, that, you know, might be trained in another discipline that isn't familiar with Indigenous studies uh, and that scholarship and history, uh, you know, everyone can relate to these real world case studies and really see not just these, you know, theoretical discussions about micro aggressions and structural racism and so on, but rather to see it in practice and how this happens in a variety of workplaces and maybe even think about, you know, their own workplace and uh, activity differently. Uh, the content is accessible. We tried very much uh, to use plain language, so not to make it as academic. So although, you know, instructors and staff uh, and students at the U of A certainly could take this course, uh, we didn't want to restrict it there. So we thought that this could be a shorter piece that even, you know, people you know, outside and other businesses could even use as a professional development tool if they so chose. Uh, we made it short, so it's short and sweet. So one, um, one, I guess, critique of the MOOC, not so much a critique, is that it's uh, it's longer. So it's 12 weeks of instruction to go through the big MOOC. Everyone should take it. There's really not an excuse not to, but people are busy. Uh, you know, a lot of things are going on. We're in a pandemic. So not everyone has the time uh, to learn. So we wanted to create something really short that, you know, this will equip the learner at least with the basics to, you know, to do better in their professional environment, whether that's academia or, you know, a bank or whatnot. So, I, you know, this whole module or the whole course would only take, I would say, an afternoon uh, to do. The modules are, although interactive and video based, quite short. Uh, so even someone could, you know, do it over you know one work day or they could even spread it out for instance an hour or so every day uh, for a week so no time constraints there uh, we do believe our findings travel so because we take an anti-oppression uh, framework and a very uh, you know try to uh, assert that people should be listening to communities and looking toward positive community-based examples that are working we focus on indigeneity. However, uh, these findings could certainly uh, apply and this type of a, a learning model could apply in other cases. Uh, for instance, uh, different gender and sexuality uh, training studies or uh, you know, to a black community or Asian studies or, or so on. 
and again, uh, the majority of our team uh, are, are Indigenous, so it's Indigenous-led scholarship. We showcase Indigenous scholarship, not only as the writers of the content, but also in the politics of citation. So we took great care to cite as many uh, Indigenous authors and scholars uh, as possible, rather than citing, you know, the same old, uh, you know, canons from back in the 1950s. We wanted to make the scholarship cutting edge, so we tried to keep it very recent, uh, where, where relevant, uh, and again, highlight Indigenous scholarship to support uh, those communities. Uh, and again, uh, pointing to uh, Indigenous-led uh, and uh, Indigenous solutions that are already working in the communities. That's it for uh, for me for right now. I look very forward to your questions. Uh, we're hoping for a spring 2021 uh, launch to this, so coming to an e-class near you soon. Thank you very much. Hi, hi. Thanks very much, Nicole. That was fantastic. Super exciting work. Uh, we have so many different uh, new educational initiatives happening in the Faculty of Native Studies right now. Those of you who were here at the beginning uh, before the presentations began will have seen our posters advertising our two new first year courses uh, that are going to be big online courses, one about stereotypes. Uh, one about Indigenous techno science, and then of course we have the structural racism module that will be coming up in the spring. So lots of things to look forward to in terms of um, outreach and, and education. Thanks, Nicole. Um, we will now move along to Patricia McCormick, uh, now Professor Emerita, has been studying the histories and cultures of Aboriginal peoples of the Western Subarctic and Northwestern Plains for 50 years and has published widely. Although retired, she continues with her own scholarship and works for First Nations and Métis communities and organizations in legal cases and environmental impact hearings. Uh, the title of her presentation today is Northern Métis, Not Buffalo Hunters, Not Road Allowance People. And we will turn it over to you now, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you. And I've unmuted, I think, right? You have, yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for, for being here. I do not have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm doing a rather old-fashioned verbal presentation with, uh, but in plain language. And I would hope that if you have some questions that you would uh, share them so that we could talk about them now, uh, today, or at a later time. Um, this this paper relates to work I'm doing right now for some Métis groups in Northeast Alberta, as well as the work I've done in Fort Chipewyan, which has a history of three very different Métis communities within Fort Chipewyan. Um, in the mid-1980s, the Glenbow Museum developed a major exhibit about Métis. Which probably most of you never had a chance to see, but at that time I was working for the Provincial Museum of Alberta and we had loaned artifacts and were involved with this. But when I visited the exhibit and read the accompanying book, I remember thinking that they didn't seem to have much to do with the Métis that I knew, the, the Métis from Fort Chipewyan in Northern Alberta and other Northern communities. Then over two decades later, the government of the Northwest Territories tried to deny the reality of Northern Métis when it refused a request by the North Slave Métis Alliance, which was based at Yellowknife, for a share of the annual harvest of the Bathurst caribou herd. Uh, the North Slave Métis were basically told that if they wanted to hunt caribou, they needed to join a First Nations group. Uh, they couldn't hunt them as Métis. Even today, Northern Métis are not part of the broader discussions of Métis-ness in Western Canada. While they are included under the rubric of the Métis Nation, and their traditional lands are used to justify extending the borders of a presumed Métis homeland into the North, their distinctive histories and cultures are not acknowledged. Indeed, there's a very strongly homogenizing and hegemonic discourse about Métis in the Canadian Northwest, which is based on Métis of Red River and the Western Plains and Parkland. So as my title implies, uh, I'm, I, I, it is common to hear Métis described as Plains Buffalo hunters in the 19th century and as road allowance people in the 20th century, uh, terms that I don't think apply at all in the North. And Métis are more commonly equated with people of French, French indigenous descent with 
peoples who come from Scottish or Orcadian ancestries kind of an add-on that don't fit well with the claim that Métis had a national consciousness and distinctive culture, um, even at Red River. Sometimes there are even extreme claims that Métis have to have direct Red River ties to be true Métis. Certainly none of the Métis in the North that I know would agree with those, with those points. So the people who became Métis in Northern Alberta and British Columbia and the Northwest Territories had lifeways and histories that began long before Red River was even founded, and they developed in different directions. And the same, I think, was also true for the mixed ancestry people with Orcadian and Scots ancestry, now also termed Métis, properly or not, who lived in the land surrounding Hudson's Bay. So I've come to think of Métis as developing in, in a mosaic pattern or sort of as a, a patchwork quilt with many different expressions of what Métisness may mean. There was a plurality of Métis cultures in the Northwest, not a singular Métis culture. So to understand how all of these developed, one has to consider a range of factors other than the intermarriages between European men and indigenous women, which did not always produce people with the Métis identity. Pardon me, that's my dog whining at, one, at my cat it's because she's bored. So if we want to look at Métis identity, I think we need to turn to the, liter the scholarship about ethnogenesis there's a wide literature in this field that is rarely consulted in analyses of the creation of new Métis identities, and that's one of the areas I've been exploring. Processes of ethno ethnogenesis are a worldwide phenomenon and occurred among Indigenous people both before and after the arrival of Europeans. Uh, it's, it's kind of a consciousness of difference that divides people into us and them. Um, and sometimes in terms of involving internal contests over what is a communal self, community self-definition. It's also ongoing and active. It isn't a static kind of, of process or static category. Uh, some of the early scholarship about ethnogenesis was rooted in European ideologies about race and racial purity, which is a relates back to the last presentation. And these concepts about, European concepts about race and racial purity informed government policies in Canada that helped shape, actually shape new ethnicities within the context of colonization. Um, much of my own research focused on histories of persistence and transformation among indigenous people of Alberta, including people known historically as half-breeds and Métis, and in light of the government policies for all, uh, all Indigenous people, both First Nations and Métis. Um, recently, I prepared an expert report for a Métis group near Fort McMurray that has many of its roots in the Indigenous population at Lac La Biche, which was a fur trade center uh, about 130 miles away from it. Uh, Alberta required Métis, requires Métis who are not members of a formal Métis settlement to demonstrate their historical and cultural authenticity in order to be eligible for consultation. Um, simply asserting Métis identities is not adequate in government eyes. Um, at Lac La Biche, there were people of mixed ancestry who lived in that area from the time of the French fur trade in the mid 1700s. They seem to have been, as far as I can determine, the, the descendants of the French engagés who either brought Ojibwe wives with them from the Great Lakes or, they mar or who married local Cree women. After the French abandoned the West during the French and Indian Wars or the Seven Years' War, they stayed in the country with their families. Very little can be discovered about them. They seem to have pretty much assimilated to a Cree way of life. Most of these people entered into Treaty Number no. 6 in 1876, as did many, many other people of mixed ancestry in other treaty areas. And in fact, the, the chief from Lac La Biche who signed the treaty at Fort Pitt used his Cree name, Piesis, rather than his French name, which was Francois Desjardins. The result is that Piesis became the chief of a legal Cree Indian band at Lac La Biche and a second Cree band just to the south at Beaver Lake. 
Heather Devine, who has traced the history of the Desjardins family, called the people at Lacklebiche the Desjardins Freeman Band, which operated, she said, as an Aboriginal hunting band and continued to cultivate Aboriginal values, attitudes, and modes of behavior. Frost, come. Pardon me. Um, <clears throat> The people at Laclabis seem to have become a somewhat differentiated, a new, what we might call an Indian band, although they've also been regarded as a proto-Métis hunting band, which could become Métis if conditions were right. They hunted buffalo in the north until those buffalo uh, were exterminated in their region. They hunted buffalo in the parkland and would even go to the plains and seem to have sometimes joined up with their First Nations relative for summer hunts and also to participate in the associated spiritual and social events of summer gatherings. I have not found evidence that they were part of the famous Métis hunting brigades, though it's certainly possible. Nor have I found any evidence that they thought of themselves or were considered by fur traders to be a people or nation distinct from the other indigenous groups surrounding them and within which they were embedded. Even in 1819, there is no mention of Métis at Lac La Biche, although there were references to Freeman and Indians. Freeman is sometimes used as a synonym for Métis, but it is not the same. There were lots of indigenous people who also had had contracts and became Freeman. Um, in 1819, one of the Desjardins men was a local chief and was made an Indian trading captain. Um, and of course, as, as in most areas, we have no information about how people thought of themselves and what they considered their own identities to be. Um, this, this time in the North, in the late 18th century and early 19th century, seems to have been a time of great flux, ethnic intermingling, and small-scale ethnogenesis. We know that the people at Lac La Biche and farther north were not infected by the pivotal events at Red River that crystallized the local Métis identity there. Um, they were significant, I think, for Northern Métis only indirectly in that those events contributed to federal policies that shaped a public face of Métisness in Canada. And it was those federal policies that would affect the Indigenous people of the Lac La Biche region uh, in the context of post-1870 internal colonization. When European people describe Indigenous people at Lac La Biche and elsewhere as half-breeds, it's almost always unclear whether that term meant anything other than an acknowledgement that they were of mixed European Indigenous ancestry. Europeans compulsively assigned racial labels and they were obsessed with miscegenation or marrying across so-called racial boundaries. So it's virtually impossible to know from the, from the primary literature whether those labels actually carried any genuine cultural meanings. No evidence exists to indicate or even suggest that Laclabish people, despite their mixed ancestry, considered themselves to be a Métis people or nation that was distinct from other indigenous people of the region. Instead, the identities of all of these people seem to be very highly fluid. Um, and it seems at least as likely that many people were polyethnic, holding multiple overlapping identities, uh, not necessarily having developed just simply singular new identities. And as one goes farther north, fewer differences emerged to distinguish people of mixed ancestry uh, from First Nations culturally. In, and people in the North tend to say, well, we're all the same people. We all live the same way. Um, and I think this was also true of many of the people in the Saskatchewan River communities. Although the scholarly literature has emphasized the Métis distinctiveness that may not have always been so distinctive. In the North, all indigenous people participated in the same basic way of life, what I've called a fur trade mode of production. Um, the major differences that seem to have existed were those of residents. Did they live in the bush or did they live at the post? Uh, the degree to which they engaged in wage labor, a lot or a little, and the religion. Were they Roman Catholic or were they Protestants? For most, it seems to have been a matter of degree, not absolutes. At Fort Chipewan, it seemed that those people who chose lives in the bush tended to self-identify as Cree or Chipewan, 
and entered into Treaty 8 in 1899. And of course, many of those people were already the descendants of mixed ancestors. Uh, they were already mixed ancestry people. Families that lived at the trading posts and emphasized the wage labor side of the fur trade mode of production seem to have been more likely to self-identify as half-breed or Métis and apply for Métis script or half-breed script. Um, so if we're going to try to understand how Métis identities in the North develop, we need to look at four different sets of factors. One is the nature of the local social community, most of which were small plural societies in which traditional patterns of marriage in one generation tended to set up the marriages in the next generation. Secondly, there are the different ways in which people within that social community participated in the local mode of production. Third, there were the various discourses used by Europeans about so-called mixed race people. And fourth, there were the political strategies and policies that governments devised to address what governments construed as differences among indigenous people and differences that government officials tended to believe were applied to people of so-called pure blood versus mixed blood and also between people who lived what they called an Indian way of life and those who they thought were on the road to European civilization. Um, the events at Red River, I think, were indirectly important to the creation of Northern Métis because they forced the Canadian government to confront a group of mixed ancestry people who do seem to have been self-consciously Métis. Government officials then developed two different policy streams for Indigenous people that reflected their own spurious understandings about race and the essential qualities of Indians, half-breeds, and Europeans. There was one policy stream for Indians based on treaties and the Indian Act. And it was assumed that people who were Indians by their race were so primitive that they required considerable guidance and supervision as they traveled that path to civilization. Um, and of course, many mixed ancestry people entered into treaty for reasons we really don't understand other than that there weren't many other benefits available to them at, at that time. Uh, and it's interesting to see that government agents actually seem to have drawn a distinction between the people who entered into the treaty, in a treaty of mixed ancestry, and other so called real Metis uh, in the early treaties. Um, in later treaties, people living the so called living the life of an Indian were actually encouraged to enter into treaty because by that time, we're looking at really 1899, it was assumed they were little, if any, different from Indians and they needed the same guidance of the government to advance. And you can't see my paper, but I'm using these words such as Indian and advance with quote marks. They're all politically charged terms. Um, the government had a very different policy stream for Métis who were assumed to be already on the road to civilization thanks to their white forebears. And they were expected to continue to advance and assimilate without the guidance of government agents. Script was supposed to give them a boost towards acquiring land. But of course, as we know from the extensive research that Frank Tuff and his colleagues have done, script was structured in such a way that it encouraged widespread fraud and most Métis failed to receive more than a fraction of its value. Yet once indigenous people applied for script, there was rarely going any going back to a treaty status. An identity that may have been fluid and multiple now became a firm Métis identity and they were excluded from the benefits that came with Indian status. Um, Laclabish is actually a really interesting case study for this because in where almost everyone had entered into Treaty 8, in the early 1880s, members of the Piesis band began to ask to withdraw from treaty, apparently because they were afraid they were going to be forced to live on a reserve. At that time, they, they, they chose not to, re or were unable to withdraw from treaty because at, they would have had to pay back all the treaty annuities they, they had received, and they, they weren't able to do that. In 1885, members of both of these Cree bands were compelled by warriors from Big Bear's camp to loot the Hudson Bay Company post at Lac La Biche, and the government later declared them to be rebel bands. The Paesis band again asked to withdraw from treaty and to apply for half-breed script. 
And the government now made this possible by uh, basically saying you don't have to uh, with pay your annuities back anymore. And we can see in that the government hoping to divest itself of large numbers of Indians to reduce its financial obligations. Um, and many, many people were actually finally able to withdraw from treaty and, and apply for script when the script commissioners finally visited Lac La Biche in 1886. Uh, interestingly, the commissioners made decisions about who could support them, they thought could support themselves and who couldn't. They didn't think they could support themselves in the future. They forced them to remain in treaty, even if they wanted to withdraw. So, it's the events of 1876 when Treaty 6 was negotiated, the conflicts of 1885, and the Half-Breed Script Commission of 1886 that created the two categories of Indians and Métis at Lac La Biche as distinct identities. And then these categories, which were endorsed by, the, by Canada, became real in a way they had not been at an earlier time. I think they channeled ethnic identities. Um, and in recent years, many Northern Métis have adopted the rhetoric of Southern Métis, along with symbols used in the South, as they have sought to be viewed as authentically Métis. So, for instance, the Métis flag that was devised at Red River now is flown or used in many Northern Métis communities in a way that I never saw when I first went North in the late 1960s. Um, after the railroad was built through Lac La Biche to Fort McMurray, after World War I, many Lac La Biche Métis sought jobs with the railroad and now live in former railway communities and Fort McMurray itself. Today, they are self-consciously and proudly Métis. Yet their journey to a Métis identity was, I think, a late development. And it was contingent on the events at Red River that shaped Métis identities there. And then especially the post-1870 government policies that presumed very distinctive First Nations and Métis identities. So I thank you. Thanks very much, Pat. Thanks. And you you did a, a masterful job of uh, petting Frost and and. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she, she is yeah she is recovering from surgery, so she has to stay in and, and be good and be quiet. But she gets incredibly bored. COVID, you know, cord, post, post surgery and COVID boredom. Yes, yes, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I'm sure we're all, we can all relate <laughs> to that in some way. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I just like to remind people uh, in the audience, please send me your questions for any of the presenters so far. We have one final presenter and then we're going to move into the question and answer period. Uh, but I'd love to hear your, love to hear your questions, please, for our presenters. Uh, finally, our last presenter is, uh, last but not least, of course, we have Marina, Marina Saparito, uh, who is a master's student in the faculty and a JD candidate at Queen's University. Her previous education was in psychology and Native Studies, both from the University of Alberta, and her research interests include health policy, equity, and whiteness in sport. And the title of her presentation today is Beyond the Rink, anti-Indigenous discrimination policies in hockey. And so Marina, it looks like your PowerPoint is working, yes? I think so, yes. Yeah, okay, excellent. Oh, take it away. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Nancy, for the introduction. Um, hi, everybody. So my presentation today is um, based off of my current master's thesis work. Um, I'm in the final stages, uh, just completing some edits of my um, analysis and things like that. Um, oh no, it seems to, can you still see my presentation? I can see it, yes. Okay, I cannot. So um, give me one second. I'm just gonna go see if I'll re-upload it. Okay, it's back. So hopefully that doesn't happen again. Um, so to start off today, um, I am going to, um, I have to apologize, I'm on an iPad. So this is unfortunately how it's gonna, uh, the presentation has to be scrolling. Um, so I'm gonna start off by sharing two experiences um, 
that have recently happened in hockey. So I'm going to start off by telling a story about um, a Alberta college hockey game that occurred between the Southern Alberta Institute um, or SAIT and Red Deer College. And this happened this past February. Um, and so what happened was a player on the Red Deer College team uh, uh, hurled a racial slur towards an Indigenous player on the SAIT team. Uh, the two players got into a bit of a scuffle um, and the referee separated them, but there was no penalty um, awarded on the um, on the play. Um, and um, following the game, the player from the Red Deer College, um, you know what, this isn't working. So I'm just gonna talk and stop sharing my screen. Sorry, everybody. Uh, Marina, do you want me to try and share this version? Sure, of Nancy, let's do that. Okay, just give me a second to pull that up. Sorry, everyone. Okay, thank you. Okay, so is that, that should be showing now, right? Yes, but I, I think you can still see my notes. It's not a full um, screen. Okay, let's try one more thing and then I'm not sure what I can do after that. So let me try one more. <laughs> it's okay, I can just talk. Uh, I'll take a, a, I'll take Patricia's lead. Is that showing oh, the correct screen now? It, it is. Um, if you want to go to the third slide, that's I think that's where it kind of went all fuzzy. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I'll start my story from the beginning. Sorry, everybody. Um, so in February of this year, uh, there was an Alberta College hockey game uh, between the Southern Institute of Technology or State and Red Deer College. Uh, during the game, a player from the Red Deer College uh, team uh, taunted an Indigenous player on Saints team with a racial slur. They got into a little bit of a scuffle and the referee separated them, but there was no penalty awarded on the play for what had happened. Um, following the game, uh, the player from the Red Deer College, along with their coach, went and apologized uh, to the player on the state team and admitted to what had happened. State, recognizing the severity of the incident and the impact it had on their player, filed a complaint with the governing body of um, Alberta College Sport. Following that, Red Deer College submitted their own complaint, stating that it was actually the Indigenous player who had started it um, and that um, the Red Deer College had taken a bunch of necessary steps following the incident and all players um, we're going to have to take diversity training, so there was no need uh, to do any other punishment. Um, the leader of the governing board ultimately decided not to um, discipline the player from Red Deer College um, after what was a little bit of a lengthy um, investigative process. Um, and following the event, the player on um, the state team um, tweeted out, uh, that Indigenous players in Alberta College Hockey and Sport uh, are now aware that the governing body no longer supports them. Um, and this is one example, it's a recent example that occurred. Um, and Jordan Tutu in his book outlines a slew of different um, incidents that happened from his time as a um, minor hockey player to being in the CHL to being a professional athlete. Uh, where he encountered discrimination. Um, and the common theme here is that each of those incidents was met by inaction by league officials, even when they were public, as a few of the NHL ones were, um, or by the referees. Um, and so these are two examples of um, anti-Indigenous discrimination in hockey. And the players are telling us that this is occurring. And any discussion surrounding this needs to be, um, needs to include structural and discursive um, conversations around colonialism. Nancy, if you wanna to move to the next slide, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so this broader pattern of inaction is the, um, I guess, focus 
of my research and I'm looking particularly at the policies and procedures um, in hockey. And so I focused in on three primary questions. The first one looks at whether or not uh, these policies have anti-discrimination um, policies. The second one is whether or not these discrimination policies explicitly state the steps that need to be taken to address discrimination and hold people accountable. And then the final one looks at the ways um, that the logics of what uh, Aileen Morton Robinson has theorized as patriarchal white sovereignty influence these policies and procedures, which ultimately um, leads to the reproduction of hockey as a colonial and nationalistic symbol of hockey. And Nancy, if you wanna move forward for me. Um, so now I'll focus in on a few of uh, the three main literature themes. So the first one is colonialism and hockey, and this really focuses in on the use of hockey in the residential school system. The second one is uh, multiculturalism, diversity and inclusion in hockey. Um, this takes more of a liberalistic approach to the re uh, research, um, but it does do a really excellent job of centering the voices that need to be heard. And then the final area of the literature um, is hockey and Indigenous players and communities. Um, so this is really focused on um, looking at Indigenous-led hockey tournaments and communities, um, as well as um, the experiences of players, which has been outlined in They Call Me Chief by Don Marks, which is um, a really important book in the area. Um, Nancy, if you want to move forward for me. Thank you. Um, so within the literature, I've identified kind of two main gaps. So the first one is that there is not a lot of research on the experience of Indigenous hockey players. There is a research network um, that's been recently developed that is has a lot of forthcoming uh, articles and literature on this. Um, but right now, uh, this is an area of uh, a gap. And then the second one is um, research on the specific uh, anti-Indigenous discrimination policies or um, discrimination policies in Canada as a whole. Some of the policies that are being used right now are quite new. So hockey in Quebec didn't have one uh, prior to 2018, um, or they might actually be quite a few years older. So Hockey Canada has not updated their bullying harassment policies since 2008. Um, so this is the gap that I'm trying to fill with my research. Um, Nancy, if you could move over one. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna take a few moments. Uh, my methodology has three components. The first one here is my standpoint. Um, so hockey has always been um, an important part of my family. It was kind of always on the TV when I was growing up. And um, my family, much like other Italian immigrants, really became passionate hockey fans. Um, and if I could identify the person that made me um, fall in love with the sport or made me wanna watch it, it would be my maternal grandfather. Um, I'd say he was the biggest fan in our family, and um, as one of the first season ticket holders for the uh, WHA Oilers, um, I heard a lot of stories growing up about Gretzky and Messier, um, and so this was something that him and I bonded over a lot uh, while he was alive, and it's something that I still um, really enjoy watching and having that connection with him. Um, so despite never playing hockey, I'm not a very good skater. Um, it was a really big part of my uh, life growing up. And this coupled along with the um, important coursework that I took in my undergrad in the family and my understanding of hockey um, as a central component of Canadian nationalism and identity uh, led me to this uh, topic. And I put a picture of Sidney Crosby and the golden goal on there because um, I think that's one of the major uh, hockey events of the last 20 years. Um, it was um, one of my memorable events. So, uh, Nancy, if you could move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so just to quickly touch upon my theoretical framework, I'm focusing on theorizing hockey, nationalism, and discourse, and I'm using uh, patriarchal white sovereignty and patriarchal whiteness to understand the connections between those three areas. Um, and my methods is um, using Foucauldian discourse analysis. And this is gonna really help me understand the way the various power relations result in discourse. Um, and Nancy, if you can move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so the policies and procedures that I'm looking at. So I'm using Hockey Canada and Hockey Alberta 
um, to help me understand the ways that the higher governing organizations, uh, the national one and the provincial one in Alberta, help to inform uh, the local minor hockey associations policies and procedures. And within central Alberta, I've focused on five primary uh, minor hockey associations, which I've listed on the slides. And within those five um, minor hockey associations, I looked at their policies, their disciplinary procedures, as well as their codes of conduct or ethics for players, volunteers, coaches, um, and parents uh, when they have them. Um, so taking all of that together, I'm trying to uh, develop a picture, an idea of what, how the higher governing bodies uh, influence the local minor hockey associations and also what the governing bodies, um, the higher governing bodies identify as um, important aspects of policies and procedures. Um, Nancy, if you could move over one. Thank you. Um, so to, I've isolated my findings into kind of three main areas. So the first one is a race blind discourse. So when you read through the policies, um, they don't identify, none of them talk about anti-Indigenous discrimination. Um, some of them won't even say discrimination. Um, they'll use words like derogatory comments, as well as none of them actually state anti-racism uh, or racism uh, policies. Um, and the function of a date race blind uh, discourse is that it helps to hide the fact that racism and discrimination exist. It's very easy for um, an organization to point to these policies that aren't explicit and say that there's no racism or discrimination because they have this policy. Um, and this happened in an incident in Quebec in 2018 at a tournament where the tournament organizers didn't deal with an incident of discrimination but pointed to the fact that they had a um, no tolerance policy. Nancy, if you could move forward. Um, so my second one, I've kind of uh, summarized it as the institution. So when you read through particularly the codes of conduct, there's this common theme of respecting hockey, respecting the game, not making a travesty of the sport. And there's less of a focus on the human individuals involved. Um, so only one of the organizations have a code of conduct or something written in their policy that states that coaches need to be able to, to give uh, or apply discipline, regardless if it is their um, star player or someone who is not their star player. The rest of the policies emphasize this need to respect the game. In fact, there's even a course that everybody is required to take in, uh, who's involved in hockey in Alberta that's called Respect the Sport. And so this is a really um, common theme. Uh, Nancy, if you can move over one. Thank you. And then finally, and I think this is um, one of the bigger findings that I've had is the disciplinary process is very arbitrary. It can be very expensive and it can be very lengthy. Um, so Hockey Canada has got a conduct management guide that you can find online. And one of their requirements when picking uh, members of the appeals committee or disciplinary committee is to pick people who have an awareness of diversity and they don't outline um, how, what that looks like, the real, uh, actual impact of it or um, how to go about this. And this actually isn't carried forward in any of the minor hockey league policies. And once you get to the local minor hockey leagues themselves, um, many of them will actually assess a fee to have um, an, an application heard by the appeals or disciplinary committee. The St. Albert Minor Hockey Association charges $300 for the disciplinary committee um, and $500 for the appeals committee. It is also up to the individual committees if the appeal is heard. So you could go through the whole um, process of creating an application and they could deny um, it being heard and investigated by those committees. Um, similarly, none of the, um, there isn't a consistency in what the um, disciplinary actions would be. Only one of the organizations, Hockey Edmonton, identifies a potential educational component to disciplinary action. Um, the rest of them either don't list anything or focus on suspending players. Um, Nancy, if you can move forward one. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to um, conclude with kind of two overarching uh, thoughts about hockey in Canada. Um, hockey Canada is the national governing body here, and it's really up to them as the um, 
top of the uh, hockey um, hierarchy to update their policies and training expectations. There's been some work um, with a group of researchers uh, to get uh, Hockey Canada to work with um, individuals in the hockey research network. Um, but unfortunately, most of the discussions have run, um, have not gone anywhere. Um, and there seems to be some pushback as to um, from Hockey Canada and some of their recommendations. Um, and the NHL, um, although is not a governing body, they are kind of the um, folk, common uh, league that people will watch. And um, they have some real uh, issues with some of their efforts. Although they say hockey is for everyone, um, when the players had created their Hockey Diversity Alliance this past um, summer, they rejected all of the recommendations by the Hockey Diversity Alliance. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and uh, although efforts are being made, um, it's important that more steps are taken. Um, so thank you everyone for bearing with me with some of the um, technical issues, um, but that's the end of my presentation. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Marina. Sorry, I'm just trying to switch back and stop sharing. Gives folks a few minutes. Uh, gives folks a few minutes to put some questions in the chat. You'll see that uh, Janet has directed you to direct your questions to me. Uh, let me just pull up the questions that I do have. 